Hey, everybody. It is Jeff, Justin, and Matt today uh, here with the Embroidery Nerd. We've got Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios, Matt Enderley from Pat's Brace, and Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. And we are all here uh, with the Embroidery Nerd. And today we are going to be discussing a uh, digitizing 911 submission. Uh, we got a file that was sent in and we're going to be uh, going over it. So um, if you are here watching, go ahead and let us know in the comments. In the comments. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some announcements that we have coming up here. Um, we have a webinar coming up here from Lee Caricelli uh, from Balboa Threadworks. That'll be happening here on the uh, this weekend, this Saturday. Uh, if you're looking for a link to that, go ahead and jump to the Embroidery Nerd page. We have that link there. Um, other than that, I think that that's all of our announcements that we have. So we'll go ahead and kind of get into this design uh, and take a look at it. So it is a digitizing 911 submission that we got. And it is digitized for 3D Puff. So we will go ahead and take a look at that. First, I'm going to pull in some comments. We have Vilma. Hello. Hope you're feeling better, Justin. Thank you. He is. Good we while. have Cindy here. Good evening. Hello, Cindy. Candace. Good evening. We have Lisa Shaw, who just finished her after hours uh, webinar. Not webinar. Live stream. I can't think today. Uh, but I, I sat through and watched that. It was pretty good. If you want to catch some of her work, you can go see it on her page. Uh, we have Bevy Jean here. Um, good evening from the rainy... Upper Peninsula. I'm going to guess that's what it is. We have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce your name because I'm going to get it wrong. I believe it's Adnan. Uh, hello, how are you? We have Cindy King. I am hearing an echo. Uh, Nadine, hi. And Candice, y'all are echoing a little bit. I believe that's Justin Speaker. We turned his mic off. <laughs> <laughs> now he's shaking his head at us. He's going to throw popcorn at us in a little bit. We have uh, Fred here. For the record, yes, I am here and on beer number one. You always have to start with number somewhere. I always recommend starting with number one. Uh, we have Donald here. Good evening from Levittown, Pennsylvania. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess I got that right. And Letty here. Hey guys, hello Letty. And we had Justin disappear on us. So I will go ahead and bring up the design here that we're gonna be taking a look at. Share screen. And uh, this he might screen, be back. He might be back. Hopefully he is. And we'll go ahead and pull up my screen here. Maybe. I pushed the button. It didn't work. <laughs> You're fired. Let me push that button. Maybe that'll help. Somebody else beat me to it. All right. So this You're is welcome. the design that was submitted to us. Um, Justin, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I had a customer send me the design and sent me a photo of, of uh, the hat they were doing, and they were having a little bit of trouble with the the blue elements. There are the three D puff part of it, um, and the the lettering underneath. They said they just wanted to clean up a little bit. So, upon just a, a quick review of it today, I did see a couple of areas that I think are easily fixed. Um, this isn't too bad of a design in my opinion uh there's there's definitely some some areas that if you if we tweak a little bit i think she'll have better results all right and so looking at this file when i first looked at it i noticed a few things too that stood out um i wanted to pull up this here so the first thing that i do whenever somebody whenever somebody sends me a design um, and let me see if I've got the right picture up because I can show the picture to sew out too. So Matt beat me to it. That is the picture of the design that was sent in. Um, and you can see that some of the, like the turning elements there, uh, are having some issues because that, those are pretty sharp angles to turn. Um, you can also see that, uh, in the junctions there where the two satin stitches, uh, meet, uh, you're getting a little bit of pull away there. Um, as well. Yep, Matt's got it. And the lettering, um, looking at the lettering that's actually in the file, I'm not sure if it's affected more by the weave of the fabric than anything else. 
Uh, so I'm not quite sure how much of that you'd actually be able to uh, clean up. You'd probably be able to clean up a little bit of it by moving um, some of the start and stops. And when I looked at the file here, I was looking at the, the jump stitches that they have in between. You can see it almost looks like they went in and trimmed some of them. Um, but I would actually move all of those closer, kind of more to the bottom, um, especially like on the U and the I and the N. When I do letters like that, I prefer to jump them lower so that you don't have kind of that little white line running across the top of the letter. Um, not quite sure what your thoughts are on that, Justin. I'm sorry. <laughs> when you jump letters, uh, do you like to try to do it more at the bottom or do you do it at the top or just wherever it's op opportunistic? I I try to, I mean, if, if it is something where they're not, if they don't like trims, the as far as automatic trims before, between letters, um, and they do want the closest point, and you're not trying to add that needle down in between to sink that that stitch in. I just try to use the closest possible connection point between the letters. Okay, I was looking at like on the I and the N. I would jump down at the bottom rather than up there at the top. Yeah, definitely. If 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 it's something where it's 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 pretty much the same distance, no matter where you pick, I usually choose the bottom. Yeah. Same here. Okay. Let's go ahead and grab a couple more comments here. I want to make sure that we got them all. We have uh, John here. Good evening to our host. Good evening. Uh, we have Chola here saying was up from Dallas. Hello. And Cindy, it's a cool logo. I don't like the loop going down so far. It means a smaller logo because of the hooping. So I looking at the horse here. Um, let me go ahead and pull back up my screen. There, Matt had to push the buttons. <laughs> I'm the producer now. He's the producer now. He needs that meme with the, uh, yeah. Anyways, so looking at, at that loop that, that runs down really, really low, it does kind of cut away from the syllable area. But unfortunately, you know, with a lot of logos like, uh, like this, they kind of draw it without sewing it on a hat in mind, and then they want it sewn on a hat later. Um, so the first thing that I did when I got this file here, and let me make sure that I pulled up the correct file, and I believe I did, this is their final file. So the first thing I always do is I always do a slow redraw to kind of look at how the elements are plotted out. Um, and I, I typically will speed it up here. Uh, on ease, I tend to do that center bar first, coming there, and then go up and jump down on either the top or the bottom. Uh, I don't know if that's personal preference or if everybody, most people does it that way, but I definitely do, do it. Um, then we got the U, the I, and I would jump those lower to the bottom if I could. The N, it does, they do turn those corners on the end, and I wouldn't. I would just end the satin stitch. And looking at the width of the letters, I don't know if I would actually uh, cap it or if I would just run a single satin column going all the way. Uh, but instead, of yeah, the 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 N and the V are the two ones that I saw the kind of the the weird angling how they how that V connects and mm -hmm. turning the corners on the end is definitely the two things that I saw right off the bat when it came to the bottom lettering. Yeah, and if you notice here, they handle this E differently than this E, and these two E's are handled the same. This one's handled differently. Um, when you typically when you digitize the lettering. If you pick one style, like if you decide that you want to do it this way, then you do it that way consistently throughout, as well as like if they decided that they wanted to do it this way, they should do it consistently without. And that's why um, I'm a big proponent of copying and pasting your letters um, just because of that. So the next thing that I notice here is that it actually caps and then it does kind of a hold down stitch as it runs around and then it kind of it comes over here and it starts at that point so i would not put down a cap right there yet um i would wait until i was sewing that area a little bit closer to actually sewing it because you're going to get a little bit of push and pull on the foam as you're running this satin here and i would not want that to affect that you know that might stick out the side a little bit if it sticks out the side you're going to notice like little loops on the outside 
Um, I also wouldn't run that long run down stitch to tack it down. Um, I would run, just run this one here, and I think that would suffice to actually hold down the foam by itself. And then I would do that element there. Um, we also don't have any bridges in between these satins here. So when this one comes by, it's going to actually, it's going to cut in and it's going to pull those apart. And you're going to see uh, a little bit of gapping in between those satins where if you put a bridge there, you won't necessarily see it. And I'll go ahead and speed it up just a little bit here. Matt's producing. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see here too, it's the same thing. There's no cap or any type of bridge. So it's gonna it's gonna separate a little bit when you get there. They also it looks like they end here with the open satin and then they start cutting there again uh, as they go by. So they're upping not the cap and then coming out here to this point. Um, right there, and you can see eventually let me pause it here and get really really lost you can see here when they come out here to this point the stitch penetrations there's not really any stitch penetration right here and the distance that we're gapping here is 1.8 millimeters and so there's nothing that's actually cutting the foam right there it's just basically uh leaving kind of an open end so i'm going to grab a couple of comments here we have jared here saying is it good to use the Cricut to cut out tackle twill for applique. Uh, I do that. Um, I prefer to CAD cut that kind of stuff when I can versus cutting it on the machine. Uh, we have Cindy here. Can you back up to where you set your foam? Absolutely. So the foam is going to go in between uh, the green and the blue text here. So it's going to run to right about there and then you're going to put in your foam and it's going to run that tack down and it actually starts this on the left side and then comes across all the way and i wouldn't do that i would uh run it from the center out and just go out to one end and then bring it around and come down so um and it looks like we have uh the digitizer the person who digitized it here nadine says letters were done on font engine using ember so I picked a true type font and digitized it. Absolutely. You know, that's that's how I would do it. Um, digitize it manually as you go. Uh, I would just handle some of these terms a little bit differently. So is there anything that kind of jumped out to you, Justin, that I didn't really go over? Uh, no, I mean, the, the, the corners, as far as the 3D por portion of it, is the, the pretty tight corners that... Uh, that we're turning instead of capping is, is the main concern. And then the bridges where the, where the junctions meet are the, are the two main concerns that I would definitely change with the, with the design. Okay. Um, I would probably, I mean, personally, I'd knock that little, I'd pull that to more of a point there at the end at, at both ends to make sure that it definitely shears that off. I like to throw a run stitch actually and drop stitches there manually and then come to that point. Um, that's a personal thing, I think. So let's grab a couple of comments here. I had trouble with the ends, whether or not to cap and couldn't get the stitches short to cut. All right. And Jane asks, how small is that lettering? So if I go from top to bottom, it's about nine millimeters. Uh, so that's not too terribly small. Eight. There we go. And the column width is roughly... 2.24 millimeters, so that's not too bad either. And we have Cindy, I was just wondering why on the 3D not extra capping before the actual satin. And Vilma here says they definitely need the caps on open ends. So, yeah, it's definitely something yeah, that definitely something you need to look at. And if, if you do come down and you terminate on any point, you don't necessarily need to cap because you are cutting it down to a point and you're using that taper to cut the foam. So if you're doing it that way, you don't necessarily need that. But on uh, on an open end, you need to cap it. And one of the things I noticed here on this cap is we have some really short stitches that are about 0.93. So they're sub one millimeter stitches. And I would pull this cap way in here to almost like four millimeters. Um, and then the other thing that I noticed here is this cap ends about 
three, four millimeters to the end. And you need to end that just a little bit sooner. So I like to go about 0.7 millimeters back. Uh, and what that does is as your satin stitch comes down and is sewing this direction, it stops it before it pushes it off the end of that and you don't get the uh, the water. I, I call it a waterfall effect personally. Um, and I, I think that that's a fairly common word, but you don't get that waterfall effect that you normally uh, would see. So let's go ahead and uh, Justin, I don't know if you're ready to bring up your screen or not. Yeah, I was going to say Matt has uh, the info from my, my first webinar that has these just in case anybody isn't familiar with the the bridging and the capping that we were talking about. Um, so we'll go ahead and bring it up here. Yeah, the end caps are, are basically you want to make sure that you're you're not going too far to the edges of the actual satin. The the grade area is kind of just representing the the top stitch as far as the satin stitch that you're going to be using to cut your foam. Um, you want to bring the the cap a ways in inwards to to stay away from the edge of the satin stitch as well as pulling it away from the sides of the set stitch to make sure that it's not pushing too much of that foam outside of the outside. Um, there is also uh, an area of, of the of the set stitch that you're going to want to to compensate for the push of the end of the of the satin so it doesn't like like Jeff was saying waterfall over that end cap. So that's what's showing that how it's peeking out the red area of that cap is peeking out past the, the satin stitch. Uh, so you have that, that area of push to the outside of that, to that satin and the, uh, the bridges as well. Do you have that as well, Mike, uh, Matt? <clears throat> uh, I didn't see uh, that. Oh, you didn't see the bridges. Okay. Um, yeah, but the, the bridges are basically the, the areas to, to, secure the, the foam down anytime you're going to have a, an intersection of two satins coming in together where they're, they're perfect, perfectly perpendicular to each other, or if they're just coming in at a juncture to make sure that that foam's not pushing up where those two meet. But that's just a, that's some of the stuff that I covered in, in the, the first part of the 3D Puff webinar series that, that we had out. Awesome. All right, so I can bring my screen back up here. And uh, Justin, you actually have a really neat way of how you mark how much push you want to do. And I think it's a really neat way. Um, and so what Justin typically does, and I'm just going to explain it, let him throw stuff at me later. But he draws a cube um, and sets it at a at what he wants that push to be. Um, and then you can bring that cube around and you can actually set it there and you can pull back your nodes so that you're able to quickly kind of identify that, um, that gap that you want just as a quick way to measure. So I, I think that's a really cool way Justin does that. Yeah, I, I, I do that just because, you know, you can set your grid and everything to certain sizes on your screen, but when you are zooming in and out and you are, you know, going in zooming in sometimes you know with your hot keys zooming in and you don't know exactly what ratio that you're zooming in on if if you if you know that that shape is going to be set at a half a millimeter or a millimeter or whatever it is that you're that you are trying to keep that consistent measurement um then you know no matter how much you zoom in and out of that screen it's going to have that 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 key for you to to reference at every little point you can just move around the screen awesome so so let's go ahead justin if you want to add ahead, your uh, add your screen yeah So the areas that I was kind of just playing with that uh, while Jeff was talking is uh, this part of the letter, how instead of the, oops, it's 
instead of turning these sharp corners, because what you're going to have is, is the, the issue of these corners in here are so tight when you're turning these corners, not only are you going to, you're going to cause longer stitch lengths, uh, going from here to here, but you're also going to cause this congestion of stitches in here, which can cause, you know, thread breaks, uh, needle breaks. Um, it doesn't lend too well when you're, when you're sewing through the foam on top of trying to get that congestion in here of stitches. So those are the, the target areas that I saw throughout is, is, is this area here. You have another corner here that's churned. This one's a little tight. Um, and of course the, the areas here and here in the horse. Um, so I was coming through and just kind of cleaning up the areas and kind of the junctions where the, the areas are going to cross over and, and change direction or have two, two satins that are, are crossing over each other. I went in and did the bridges, which are these here, where it's just the light. Either you can use manual stitches, running stitches, or it's just, just a, a light coverage area that kind of tacks down that, that foam. So the, the two areas that the two satins are, are crossing over are meeting. It's going to tack down that foam. Um, as you can see in the, in the turns, instead of actually turning these areas, I cap those areas to make sure that the, the, not only the rounded part of these, these satins are going to stay rounded and then you can all, uh, don't have to worry about trying to, to come to a really fine point at the end of those. If you use the cap to actually use as your, as your shape of that rounded edge, then you can come back the other direction with just starting off with the, the flat part of, of that leg coming down. So um, not only does, does using caps, you know, cut off the edges of, of your, of your satin stitches, but I, in, in situations like this, especially in rounded areas, I actually like using the caps as, as kind of your, your piece that's going to shape the form that you're looking for. So it's, it's, it's working in two ways. It's gonna, it's gonna cap off your end so you can just do a straight line coming off of it as well as, as finishing that, that rounded shape. So if you break down the individual pieces, I have, I have a cap here. I have a leg that's going up this way. I have another cap for this in area. I have a straight piece coming down. <clears throat> and also in between those, I also have these areas where I bridged the areas where these are overlapping to make sure that that foam is not going to be sticking up uh, where those interjections or those, those junctions are. Awesome. So I'm going to grab a couple more comments here. Um, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. So Cindy was saying, I was just wondering why on the 3D not extra capping before the actual satin. Uh, Vilma definitely needs caps. And Cindy, not sure capping is the right word. Uh, if you're Cutting off the end of a, if you're finishing the end of an open satin, then you definitely want to cap. If you're at where two satins intersect, it's where they, um, where you want to bridge. Uh, and we have Valentina. Hello, how are you? And um, the graphic that Justin showed earlier with the capping, that was actually from your webinar, wasn't it, Justin? Yeah, that was from the from the first part of the webinar, uh, the the basics of 3D puff embroidering on hats. So there's a lot okay. of good information. Okay. Actually, we, Matt, if you want to throw that, uh, that discount code up, um, since we are talking about a 3d puff design, we thought we might throw out a discount for that part one. Well, that says puff three. So it should Oops. be just puff one. <laughs> um, I have the banner ready. First fired. <laughs> the, uh, the first part of the, the webinar has a lot of this good information. If you are attempting to try to do a 3D puff design and you are new to it, um, if you haven't caught it yet, part one covers from start to finish the digitizing the process. Um, that'll cover a lot of the stuff that, that we're seeing as far as issues in this in this design. Um, but we do have a promo code, promo code D911 for 10% off. And we're gonna run that for a week, right? Next Tuesday, Matt? Uh, yes, until Tuesday. 
Right. Yep, and, and we'll definitely pop it up here again before the end of the live. I am going to grab one comment here, and Cindy says, hey, you have the Puff Pro to take care of the foam that pops out. Uh, Justin actually invented that tool. I did. And Matt's got it right there. <laughs> so Justin, tell us a little bit about why you invented this tool. Well, how many, uh, how many times that we're sitting there dealing with uh, those little bits of foam sticking out and even if you have a perfectly done design as far as the digitizing um foam it's gonna it's gonna want to poke its way out everywhere everywhere it possibly can so you are going to have that cleanup process no matter what um some designs more than others uh, there's times where you know i'll run a hat and it's pretty much flawless besides one little poke that i need to do and there's other times where you know I'm poking all over and I'm, I'm heat gunning and you know a lot of times the the contrast of the of the thread to the foam and the hat colors is going to weigh in a lot of it um you know white thread on white foam is going to definitely show a lot less than if you're using a, a red thread that doesn't possibly or match the red foam or you only have orange foam or, or something like that where there's a little bit of contrast you're going to see a lot more foam sticking out so there's a lot more uh, to clean up so uh, the, the this 3D Puff uh, Pro tool that I came up with, it's it's replacing when you're just jabbing that foam in with the edges of your scissors or something like that, and then you end up clipping thread, damaging your garment. Uh, this 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 tool is perfect for for the cleanup where you're not going to damage anything. Awesome, and we do have a uh, a comment here. Vilma says, "I recommend the webinar. I learned a lot from that." Always great when you have somebody that, you. that learned something from the webinar that you taught. And Matt has it pulled up here on the screen. Uh, this is the breaking down the basics. And then we have part two as well, where you go into multiple layers uh, and some textures. And then part three, which is, I, I highly recommend all of them. Even if you don't want to do the digitizing, uh, I definitely think part one is worth um, worth its weight in gold. Um, part two, I, part two and three, I think are a little more on the digitizing end. But even if you don't want to digitize, it's really good to know and kind of understand what needs to be done, so you can identify if you get a file back from a digitizer and it's not quite going out right. You can go, oh, you know what? I think I know what the issue is. So that's definitely something to keep in mind so um cindy asks do you all do 3d on flat garments very often i can honestly tell you i have not done that on a flat garment justin i don't know about you i don't only because um it, it can be done but you know hats aren't laundered and if they are they're seldomly laundered um so the integrity of the of the, of the th top thread on the phone is going to last a lot longer it's going to probably outlast the actual hat um something like a shirt or a sweatshirt that's going to be washed quite a bit i've seen it where that that thread's going to start wanting to to loosen up a little bit and it's, it's going to look a little weird and it's going to wear a little bit i mean there is there is a laundering instructions for the foam so, so it can be washed it's not something where it's going to fall apart but it's it's going to wear a lot faster i think in, in something that's going to wash very often Yep, and I'm going to pull up a comment here from Nadine. I kept trying to add stitch nodes to cover the areas where the pup was peeking out and also to bring more stitches into the end points. Um, I don't know if I'd necessarily so, add uh, nodes versus objects. Yeah, exactly. The, the nodes the nodes, and in, 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 uh, in adding stitches into those fine little areas is, is actually working against you because um, the more you hammer into those small areas is the, the more thread breaks or, or needle breaks. And, and it, most of the time, it's not going to solve the problem. Um, like I said, there, there's always going to be that cleanup process afterwards that that you just know with 3D Puff that you're going to have to do. Uh, so some of it you're not going to avoid in the digitizing. Um, but using the cap strategic, strategically and uh, the bridges where, where any of those caps in, in, not caps, but any of the, of the straight lines of the satins meet, um, it's hopefully going to hold down the majority of what, what you're seeing um, in those junctions. Um, so the, the, the poking in is going to be very minimal or the areas that you have to poke in are going to actually be where kind of 
caps in, in a straight line kind of meet. So you're, you're not going to, it's going to be just a quick little poke that you can do at a corner. Um, but the corner tip supports, uh, sometimes if, if you are, if they're, as far as the tip support or the corner support, I'm sorry, the top image that you see here, um, when, when that corner is a really long stitch and those stitches are, are longer stitches, you do have a tendency where you have that foam that's going to find that, that weaker part of the, of the tip and, and it's going to, or the weaker part of the corner and it's going to want to push out. So, um, so you, you do support that area with just a couple of, of running stitches, a couple of running stitches to, uh, support that corner. And then as far as the, any time you come to a point, you could also use a, a running stitch. <coughs> Excuse me. You could use a running stitch to kind of come out and, and cut that, that foam. So you're not trying to do too many points into the, to the end of that, that tapered edge, like the, like you see in the, the end of the A there. So. And I'll pull up a couple uh, more comments here. Eric says, you're the only one but me I see teaching this corner support. Sometimes it can really save you. Uh, same with cutting the points. I'm a big fan of that as well. Uh, we have, let me back up a couple here. Uh, Letty here says, I did it on the jacket that everyone signed, but the intention wasn't that it would be washed. Uh, you know, I think washing a garment like that actually... You know, you have to think of the integrity of the sweater and how much density you're throwing down into it. With um, with running a satin stitch, you're probably a, a puff satin stitch. You're probably a third or better, um, more density. Well, two thirds, I guess. Well, I'm trying to think of the math in my head. Point four standard density here, about a point one six, so about twice as much density in there, and you're going to be driving into that and um, you're going to be spreading out the, the fibers in there, and so the washing is going to be a little bit more difficult and wear on a little bit more. So uh, Nadine says, but it didn't work on that. Uh, Matt pulled up. He did a three-puff patch, so that will also be uh, puff on a flat. We have a great video of that where Justin compares my version of puff to his version of puff, and you can see him kind of smirking there because to give him a hard time about that every now and again. But uh, that's definitely one we did on a live that you guys can check out uh, as well. Um, so let me go here. And Vilma says, Wilcom has a 3D satin stitch, which can be used on flat garments to give you that effect like puff. So the problem that typically runs with that is you're doing a satin, you're doing a narrow satin and then a wider satin and then a wider satin and finally an even wider satin. And so you're actually building up layers of thread to get that puff look. And the downside to that is when you build up a layer of thread on the top side, you're also building up a layer of thread on the bottom side. And you have to kind of keep in mind that when you're adding density to both sides, you're getting puff on both sides of that and you have to really be careful that it's not going to get too stiff. Um, and Matt brought up a picture and definitely brought up the wrong person when he brought up that picture. But let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and tell us about that, Matt. Yeah, so this is actually the first digitizing I did myself. And when I was using Wilcom Hatch, I was like, oh, it looks a lot better on the screen using this 3D satin. Uh, so that's what I did. All of these were 3D satin for the wings and the star and everything. And now you kill them. I, oh, hold on. I pushed the right button. There you go. We're having difficulties here at Nerd Central or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, essentially, it's it's bulletproof. It doesn't look very good. That's also partially probably because of my digitizing or lack of digitizing skills then. Um, but yeah, the back is also not very pretty like what Jeff said it would be like. All right. And so let's go ahead and pull up a couple more comments here. We have Cindy saying the raised satin, I've used that some, but on towels or stronger fabrics, it's definitely, you know, just because you're not putting the density on the outside edge doesn't mean that you're not adding it in the center and building it up there too. 
Um, and Eric here says, I find a lot of folks with tight nodes and over tight corners building up excess density, getting lumpy finishes and breaks if their short stitching is on, getting more show through and texture than what they were trying for less. So one of the things to like, yeah, when you're plotting stitches around a corner, it's going to try and shorten up and put the needle penetrations closer on the inside and spread them out a little bit on the outside. Um, so you have to just kind of keep that in mind when you're turning a really tight corner, it's really going to cram those stitches in there and you're putting too many stitches in a, in such a small area that the garment can't expand to, uh, compensate for the needle anymore. And now you're going to be getting needle breaks. It's going to be snapping off as it goes in there. So that's something to always kind of keep in mind and think about too. So, um, here we go. We've got yeah, I think it's more a little bit more finesse when it comes to to digitizing 3d puff corners and ends of of satins to to cap them it's it's not just hammering in as many stitches as possible to make sure you cut the foam um it's a little bit more like i said a little bit more strategic planning uh when it comes to to how you're gonna turn a corner or support a corner or or cut those really fine tapered ed ends or or um cap an area like you said instead of turning that really hard curve where you're um you're going to be affecting the outside and inside stitches of that curve yep so we have cindy here that says jeff i've noticed that when i use a raised satin on a cap it seems more raised on the inside and yeah i mean i've used it on a cap and i actually and i don't have it behind me but it might one of my very first patches i was like oh this is really cool let me check that box and did the 3d satin and um, I had an edge run underlay and a zigzag underlay, and it actually did an edge run underlay and a zigzag underlay for every layer. And by the time it got to the fifth layer, because I was doing five layers, it actually, I was starting to have problems with the underlay poking out the sides. Um, and so that's something that you have to kind of be wary of when you're using a 3D satin. It's great in applications that you can use it where you don't, not, not necessarily you're going to use foam, uh, but there's, you know, with everything, there's pluses and minuses. So uh, Nadine says, yep, that's exactly what I was fighting and couldn't figure out how to rem remedy it. Thankfully, no needle breaks. Yeah, I think when you start getting overly dense, you're going to start seeing like, um, it's going to start skipping stitches. Typically, you're probably, you can get some frayed thread and it'll start kind of shredding up there. And then, you know, ultimately when you get too hard, it starts to break. Not only that, if if you if you are adding that many stitches into to that tapered edge, um, when when the rest of it's digitized properly, you're going to have that nice you know lofty 3D foam. And if you're hammering that many stitches into the, that taper, it's actually going to get you know it's going to start tapering down as far as matching down the foam even more. So you kind of have these these nice bold lines, and it's going to come through. Sometimes you even get if you ever ever see kind of a, a waviness in in foam where those stitches are kind of just like pushing around that foam and that push and that foam is pushing out uh, against all those stitches that you're laying down. You get kind of this wonky waviness to, to foam. Um, I know back when I very first started digitizing for foam, when it was just coming out, I thought cutting foam, hammer, hammer the density as much as you can. And I was getting these weird wavy, wavy lines and it, it took a lot of trial and error to to find that that happy medium or that fine line where you're you're putting enough density in to cut the foam but you're not causing so many other issues trying to put too much density so there's there's that finesse when you're when you're digitizing the foam well and if i remember right and i'm going to take you way back into the day uh when they initially started teaching foam they would they would teach you a really like short run stitch to go around the outside edge and then to throw a satin over the top of that um, and that presents its whole new self with a, with a new set of problems. Um, but wasn't that what they were teaching there for a while, Justin? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> we got him. I've been, I've been, no, I've been trying to mess with my, I know there's the echo. I've been trying to mess with my, my settings. In between settings. Here, so you guys didn't hear so much echo. I was talking about when they initially started uh, teaching 3d puff. And they used to teach like a, a really short stitch run stitch that would go around the outside edge and then try to get yeah. you to cover that. Um, that that's that's how they used to do it back when it first came out, I, th I think. And, and 
the industry's kind of went away from that's that. how i was that's how i was shown originally from from people that were three uh, digitizing 3d pop i never had any success with that i had a lot of looping uh that would stick out of the outside of that the the outer or the the top thread the top satin um the you, you know you don't want to go too far in to make sure that you're getting coverage over that top satin because you're you're cutting the foam too far into that to that satin but if you try to do you know right to that edge a lot of those those cutting running stitches would would definitely to stick out the outside of that so yeah i i never had much success in, with that technique so i'm gonna i'm gonna bring oh. in this comment here because it made me chuckle a little bit <laughs> do you like tipped out edges like yeah. stitches on the edge because that's how you get tipped out yeah. stitches on the edge yeah. That just kind of made me chuckle there. Um, there we go. I'm going to make sure that we're catching all of the comments here. And so, you know, other than those, you know, the capping of the hard angles um, and some of the corner supports, is there anything else that you would really change on this file, Justin? Um, just just that when, when you are at, because this is all pretty much one fluid uh, satin stitch, especially on the horse part of it, um, there is going to be some some pathing that you need to to fix because you are going to add the bridges because because what I like doing is is I'm going to add mine to this to the stream really quick. Instead of like Jeff had mentioned, capping this here at the beginning when when this tack down stitch, by the time you you come back and do this lettering and come back to the horse, uh, there's going to be shifting on this hat. So this this particular beginning of this satin may not line up all the way over this this uh this cap end so i actually when when i'm when i'm traveling and i'm capping and i'm bridging and everything i try to do a little section at a time so when i'm traveling through this um coming through and So I start with a with a cap here, I'm sorry, a bridge here, and come down bridge, bridge, walk over to the end, and then I cap. I work my way back up to the to the next cap that I'm gonna have to do. So I'm not I'm not doing caps and, and bridges throughout the whole element that I'm doing. Because when you're traveling back and forth to that that much on a hat, especially when you're spanning, you know, two three inches from from each other, um, by the time you get back to to areas that you may have bridged, you know, two inches away, you're going to have that foam shifting and you're going to have that hat shifting uh, on that rounded surface or the curved surface on a hat. So I try to try to keep smaller areas to to bridge cap, so bridge cap so as you're traveling through through the design so um so you're not going to have that that shifting and and things maybe not possibly lining up or 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 getting covered as far as under stitches later on as you travel throughout the design so um the continual stitch that you see in the horse that's that's starting from one end and going all the way around it's making those sharp sharp corners um, if it was a shape that doesn't need any, uh, bridging, you know, throughout, then that's, that's the, the ultimate goal is to try to keep that needle down all in one stroke of a satin. Um, but when we, when I do go in and I add, you know, the, the caps and the, and the bridges and, and whatnot, you're going to definitely need a little bit more, uh, pathing and sequencing. And I know that's something I definitely do a little bit differently than you because I like to literally run my satin stitch almost right to the edge, stop it, do my cap, and then jump back. Um, and I know like some people like to run it before they run the element. If if it is, you know, if it's say like there's a shape like a T, and it, and it is a bigger shape that that spans a good two three inches from you know, the, the vertical part of the T to the top part of the T. Um, 
instead of coming to kind of go through and bridging all the areas and coming back and, and capping the other areas and coming back down, I think you're going to run into that, that problem again, where if you're, if you're traveling too far back and forth on a hat and there's an, a span of an area uh, and time and, and, and the, the, the movement of the machine and your needle where that foam's going to start shifting uh, your, your design itself is going to possibly shift on, on the curvature of the hat. So yes, if I know I have to eventually get to that area and that's the last cap I need to do, like you said, there's times where I'll, I'll travel and do my satins, get to that end, stop, cap it. And then, so you're, you're pretty much just doing that very last piece all in that same area. All right. I'm going to grab just a couple. I'm going to grab one question up here and it says, is this all group all Wilcom and Baird and related? Um, we're showing this in Wilcom software. Uh, what we're talking about is more, um, theories and techniques basically that you can use on any software platform, uh, which is, is really one thing that's really nice about Justin's webinars that he has is they're all very heavily on theory and less on software. Um, and Baird and I don't have a Baird. <laughs> I, I don't yeah, think anybody I mean, on the stream has one. Everything, everything I teach in, or we teach in these lives and I taught in, in those webinars, they're, they're theory based and, and yes, they are shown in Wilcom because that's the software that I use. Um, but I, I try not to be too specific to the software because anything that I, that I teach as far as technique can be done in any software out there as far as digitizing the software. Um, so if, if you do watch the webinars, if you haven't seen them, um, they, they are more in theory. They will show you techniques that done in Wilcom, but they're not Wilcom specific. All right. All right. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to, we've got, yeah. <laughs> I'm counting in my head. That's never a good thing. We've got 13 minutes and I don't think we're going to be able to get this all uh, completely digitized uh, in 13 minutes. And so I don't even think I'm going to try to completely. Uh, no, uh, but Nadine, I, I will finish off the file a little bit later this evening when we're done and, and get you the finished file. And that way you can kind of review it on your own time and, and go through it and see the changes that uh, that we're talking about here. But I'll go ahead and get those, those corrected in the file so you can check it out and, uh, and go through and see what we did. Awesome. Well, I'm going to mute Mike's here. And uh, we're just going to go over here really, really quick. And I'm going to grab a couple of comments. And I uh, also want to mention I'm hearing serious audio feedback from Jeff. Uh, we're, we do know about that. We're trying to... Um, to take care of it. We've got John here. Uh, thank you for the explanation. You're welcome. Nadine, there's a lot more going on in the design than I saw. There is, and makes so much sense. Awesome. We're glad that we could help. So before we close out here, I'm going to uh, go ahead and I'm going to click on the banners and we're going to see if I can do this. One of them in here, maybe I'll have Matt do the banners. Uh, we we wanted to go ahead and show the uh, discount code for Justin's uh, webinar that he had there. Uh, again, that's we hosted that over on the Embroidery Nerd uh, page. There we go. I'm going to use the word page. Uh, we hosted that over there on the Embroidery Nerd page, and Justin is giving out a discount here for 10% off of that going on until next Tuesday. Uh, just so you guys are aware, uh, if you like what we do and you want to support us, one of the easiest ways to support us is to watch us on YouTube, actually. Uh, it helps with our YouTube watch hours and allows us to try and monetize that channel a little bit so we can continue to bring uh, as much free content as we possibly can. Uh, and then also, I'm just going to run through here. Uh, I'd like to thank Justin for his explanations and, and drilling into that design there. Um, I'm going to run through uh, some of the announcements here and we're going to end a little bit early. Uh, coming up this weekend, again, we have uh, Lee Caracelli's third uh, webinar on blending and shading. Uh, you can go ahead and get to that on the link below, uh, embnerd.com forward slash blending three. Uh, it is our third webinar. If you've missed the other two, you can find links to that there. And honestly, you know, with the stuff and the style that Lee teaches, it's really, really neat because you don't have to see uh, blending one to take blending two, and you don't have to see blending one or two to take blending three. The way her techniques kind of flow and the way that she teaches is really cool that it's very you know, you can take one of the three and still get something out of it. Of course, if you take all three, you get the most. But uh, I, I just really like her teaching style and the way that she's able to do that. So if you guys want to catch that again, that you can go to that link 
and uh, you can check that out there. Um, and again, that 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 is coming up here this weekend. And I just jumped back in here, and I'm going to grab a couple more comments here. We have Vilma saying thank you, Jeff, Matt, and Justin for a lovely lovely session. If you keep safe, thank you. Uh, thanks, guys. And Arnaldo here says it's not John. I just share. The video on group for member to join and learn. Yep, we we really want everybody to uh, learn, and we're glad that we can help out. And uh, here we go. Uh, I will be going through these guys' past videos to see more from them. Awesome. We definitely appreciate the support. So with that, guys, that's all of the announcements I have. I don't know if you guys have any announcements uh, as well. As well. The government. All right. Awesome. So. We'll go ahead and close this out. Close this uh, out. Uh, One more, if, if you don't mind, next Tuesday. Uh, we are on Tuesdays now. Um, next Tuesday, there is going to be a interview with uh, Nancy. Nancy. Nancy from uh, Madeira. Uh, and that is at a special time, correct, Jeff? Uh, I believe so. It's I want I'm, I want to say like 2.30. Uh, we'll double check. And we're going to make sure that we post that up ahead of time so that you guys can uh, click on the little remind me button. And so we'll post up a little more information about that as it gets closer, but we are, it is going to be a little bit early so that we can accommodate Nancy's schedule. Yeah. So check us out next week on the, on the uh, interview with her. That's going to be some good information. All right. And so everybody with that, I'll go ahead and uh, outro, I guess we have Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. We have Matthew Enderly from Patch Praise, and I am Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. And all three of us are here with the Embroidery Nerd today. We'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with us, and we'll catch you guys later.